In, in this module, we're going to talk about some of the deviations from Ma uh, Mendel's predictions. So Mendel will study a very basic system, or very simple, in which the, the genes express in the way he predicted it, and they were also located on different chromosomes, or at least they are sorted independently. So let's see here what happens if the genes are located on the same chromosome. If you're looking at two genes at the same time, and they are located on the same chromosome. So, um, for example, here we have, this is, these are the parents. So here we have one parent, and that parent is homozygous recessive for both gene A and B. And the second parent, in this case, is homozygous also, but homozygous dominant for both genes A and B. So every, every person, has, every diploid, has two sets of chromosomes, and they have two copies of each allele, and in this case, they're homozygous for the recessive allele of A and homozygous for the recessive allele of B. And the other parent is homozygous dominant for A and homozygous dominant for B. So let's see um, then what happens to the offspring of these parents. So let's say these were your parents, and now you inherited one chromosome from parent one. And since that parent only had recessive alleles, you inherited recessive alleles for A and B from that parent. And from the other parent, you also receive one chromosome. And since that parent only had dominant alleles for A and dominant alleles for B, you receive those. And now you are a heterozygous. So that, this makes things interesting because when you produce your own gametes, your own gametes can have this combination, which we will call the parental combination, as you inherited from one of your parents, and this combination is also parental as you inherited from one of your parents. But it is possible because of crossing over that your offspring inherit allele B from that you inherited from your mother, the recessive allele, with the dominant allele that you inherited from your father, for example. And this is what crossing over does. So if there is no crossing over, the gametes you will produce, so this is the heterozygous individual, you have one chromosome that has both recessive alleles and one chromosome that has both dominant alleles because that's how you inherited this. You inherited from your mother and this you inherited from your father. The cell is getting ready for meiosis, so the first thing it has to do is replicate its DNA. That's why we have two sister chromatids on each of these chromosomes. And in this case, we're simulating that meiosis doesn't, doesn't happen with crossing over, so just the chromosomes stay separate. Therefore, the alleles stay in the same combination as you inherited from each parent. And remember, meiosis 1 uh, separates the homologous chromosome. So after meiosis 1, when you start meiosis 2, you have two cells. And they each now have just one chromosome. And uh, in meiosis 2, you will separate that cell into four cells with just one sister chromatid. So this will be the four resulting cells. And these cells, as you can see, their, their uh, alleles are the same as you inherited from either one of the parents. So either as you inherited from your mom, both recessive alleles, or as you inherited from your dad with both dominant alleles. On the other hand, if there is recombination or if there is crossing over during meiosis, this happens during meiosis one, so prophase in meiosis one will do recombination, and this is the sister chromatids of each of the homologous chromosomes come together and exchange or swap pieces of information. And the result of that is that we have this here, this is a recombinant chromatid. So this chromatid has the original recessive allele that was present in, in the maternal chromosome, but now it has the dominant allele for B, that comes from the paternal chromosome. So this, this chromosome swapped this piece with the homologue, and now we have a recombinant chromatid that has allele from one parent and a, another allele for the other gene from the other parent. Now when these cells, so here we have the two cells that resulted from meiosis one, and they each have one chromosome, but now these chromosomes are recombinant. When we look at the cells, that result from meiosis 2, 
we have this cell that has the same combination of alleles as the mother, so this we'll call a parental gamete because it has the same combination as the grandparents of the offspring, actually. And this one we call a recombinant because now it has one allele from the grandmother and one allele from the grandfather. And here we have a recombinant chromatid also, but this is the opposite so of the previous one since they are the ones that exchange pieces of information. And then this chromatid here is parental because it has the same combination of alleles as it was present in the original chromosome. Now this doesn't have to be exactly this way. Both chromatids exchange DNA, so they both do um, recombination and crossing over. This is just one example to show you the difference between those two. So let's look at this other example. Here we have an individual that is heterozygous for three genes. So this individual is a diploid, a diploid, so it has two chromosomes. These are homologous chromosomes. This individual inherited this chromosome from one of his parents and inherited this other chromosome from the other parent. And they're homologues, so they have exactly the same genes, but maybe different alleles. And since this individual is heterozygous, he got a recessive allele from one parent and the dominant allele from the other parent. So this L for the um, whether having a long or short pollen grain, here the P represents purple flowers, which are dominant to white flowers. And it also has all these other genes, but if you can see those genes are homozygous, so it is homozygous for this, they have the same allele, so it doesn't make much of a difference whether the allele comes from one parent or the other, because it only has one type of allele. And it's also heterozygous for seed shape. So here we have round seeds, which are dominant to wrinkle seeds. And this individual is about to do meiosis. It wants to reproduce. It wants to produce gametes. The first step before you do meiosis is to replicate your DNA. So you still have to make a copy. And that's what we see as sister chromatids. So now that we've replicated, now that we've replicated the DNA, now that we've done synthesis in the S phase, we have two sister chromatids and they have identical information because they each have one template strand and one uh, newly replicated strand. So we are ready to continue meiosis. And for, for this simulation, we're going to take one of the sister chromatids. So again, this happens in both sister chromatids, but just to simplify it, we're just going to look at one at a time, and we're going to break them into sections in where possible places where crossing over could happen, and we do the same thing for both homologs. And the way we're going to simulate, we're going to simulate where crossing over happens by rolling a die. So once we roll it, the number in the die will tell us whether crossing over happened at one of these locations. So we rolled the dice and we found we got the number 5. So we're going to simulate that crossing over happened at location 5. So we cut here and we swap everything from there on. So here it is, we swap it. So this piece of the chromosome now comes from the other chromosome and this piece comes from the previous homologue. So they swap these pieces. And this results in what we call a recombinant chromatid. So this chromatid had the parental in alleles for pollen length and flower color, but now it has the allele for seed shape that came from the other parent. So this is this is a, a recombinant because this combination of the recessive allele together with these two alleles didn't exist before. Now keep in mind that we're saying that this comes from the parent, but this is the parent of the individual doing meiosis. So when we say the little r comes from the other parent, we really mean the grandparents of the future offspring, because this is this is happening in uh, I don't know person one, and and these chromosomes come from person A's mom and person A's dad, but then. Person A will have their own baby, and then this will be grandmother of, per, of um, that baby and grandfather of that baby. So the, the point is, crossing over doesn't happen. Exchanging the chromosomes of mom and dad for the baby 
because this happens before the gametes even meet. So this is how we produce the gametes. So this might be happen, this will happen to produce the sperm, and then a separate process like this will happen in the mother to produce the egg. And then in the egg, to produce the egg, the mother will exchange the chromosomes that she got from her own mother and from her own father. And to produce the sperm, the dad of the future baby is in exchanging the DNA from his mother and from his father. Okay, so let's let's do another simulation, and in this case, we roll the die again, and we got the number two. So now we are going to simulate crossing over at position number two. We swap those pieces between the two homologs, and now we have the dominant allele for long pollen grain together with the dominant allele for flower color and seed shape, which is a recombinant chromatid because this is not the original combination. The original combination had the recessive allele here. So we can simulate this many times and keep rolling the die and we'll get different numbers. But notice that pretty much any number that we get, whether it's 3, 4, 5, or 6, will swap the alleles for seed shape with the alleles for flower color and pollen grain. But only, so any of these combinations or any of these uh, numbers that we get from the die will give us pretty much the same result. So whatever we split the chromosome here, 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 or here, we would end up with the allele for R swapping with the allele here and these two remaining together. There is only one number that the die can fall off on and uh, that will give us, if it's the number two, then we will split the allele for pollen gray with the allele from flower color as it happened here. So there are many more possibilities that could give us a recombination between P and R than the number of crossing over events that could give us a combination between L and P. Thus the farther apart the alleles, the genes are, the more likely that their alleles can recombine. So that's what we he see here. R and P are really far apart and any recombination in between of them, this has a lot of possibilities that recombination will happen in between, will lead to them being in um, recombining so that this P can go with this R or remain with this original R. On the other hand, very few chances of recombination happening between the L and the P. So fewer chances for them to recombine so that the original I uh, L is more likely to remain with the original P than to recombine with its homolog. And this is how we come up with this graph. So this graph shows distance on the chromosome, so how far those genes are on the chromosome, and recombination frequency or likelihood that they will be able to swap or exchange. We see the farther apart the genes are located on the chromosome, the more likely that they will recombine so that like we said, as, as you get farther away, it's like that P and the R, they get more likely that crossing over will happen between them. So that they can end up with their original combination or the new recombinant combination. But notice that this flats at uh, 50%. So recombination frequency is never higher than 50%. 50% means you're equally as likely to be inherited in the parental com combination so the original P with the original R, or be inherited as the recombinant combination, which would be the P allele from one parent going with the R allele from the other parent. And it's never more than 50% because that would mean avoidance, which is, is, it doesn't happen. There is no mechanism for that. So when, when alleles have a recombination frequency of 50%, we say that they are sorting independently. So that is, the allele from gene L is just as likely to be inherited with either one allele from gene R. It doesn't, they don't have to come together. So they are independently because whether you inherit the recessive allele for L gives you equal chances of inherit the dominant or the recessive allele for R. They're not, they're not linked. So they are sorting independently. On the other hand, 
if they have a recombination frequency of less than 50%, that is when they're closer on the chromosome, we call them to be linked or genetically linked. So don't confuse this with sex link. That's a different thing. That's only when your genes located on sex chromosomes. In this case, we say link because if you inherit, for example, the pollen example, the, if you inherit the dominant allele for the pollen grain, you're more likely to inherit, in this case, in this example, since the dominant allele for pollen grain was in the same chromosome as the recessive allele for flower color, if you inherit the dominant allele for pollen grain, you're more likely going to inherit the recessive allele for flower color because they were located in the original chromosome together. So they will show some genetic linkage where inheriting one allele from one gene makes you more likely to inherit the allele that was accompanied from the other gene. And this is very important because for a long time before we had all the SPIT systems for DNA sequencing, using recombination frequency was the way to locate genes on a chromosome, to map genes on a chromosome. So if two, the alleles for two genes were very likely to be inherited together, we could assume that those will be located close together. And then we could see, based on how many offspring will inherit in one combination or the other, what was that distance. So the distance of two genes in a chromosome is proportional to the recombination frequency, or how many of the offspring inherit both of those alleles versus recombinant combinations of those alleles. So this is how gene mapping began, and this is how we originally were able to figure out in which chromosomes this different genes were located and what were the relative distances between them before we could actually sequence the DNA and see the actual base pairs.